Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. During the question and answer session of today's call, you may press star 1 to ask a question. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'll turn the call over to Linda. After it's easy, you may begin. Thank you, and good morning for those of you joining from the east and west coast of the United States. Uh, thank you for joining us from Luxembourg. Uh, thank you for joining us for our How Reach is Affecting the Chemical Industry webinar. I am pleased to know that we have 21 people registered for this webinar today. Um, in this webinar, you will learn about the most comprehensive European chemical regulation, which is REACH, registration, evaluation, authorization, and restriction of chemicals, and how it is affecting global suppliers of chemicals as well as products. This regulation is, needs to be understood as it does not only affect the manufacture of chemicals and products in the European Union, but also the import of chemicals and products into the European Union. Preparing financially and the allocation of resources to comply with this regulation uh, should be addressed. And this webinar will cover why REACH is needed, determining if your product is an article or a corporation, who can complete the registration process, roles in the supply chain, registration procedure, advantages or SIEF and consortia participation, the MSDS and dossier requirements, SEHC content requirement for articles, and advantages of the one only representative role. My name is Linda Abrazizi, and I'm a Senior International Trade Specialist for the Global Knowledge Center for the U.S. Commercial Service and Global Markets of the Department of Commerce, and I will be today's moderator for this webinar. This webinar is being brought to you by the U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service slash Global Markets and TUV Rhineland in North America. Mr. Scott Segamay is our REACH expert. He will be our first speaker. And he is a REACH expert in the USA Business Development Manager for REACH Services, where he has been there for seven years in the environment compliance industry for TUV Ryland of North America. Our next speaker is Natalie Morrell, who is our senior consultant and international project leader for REACH in Luxembourg. And she has a chemical engineering background and has been a REACH expert and has traveled within REACH for eight years and is currently employed at Lux Control, which is a member of the TUV Ryland Group. All of our speakers will be available at the end of this presentation to your, answer your questions, and contact information also will be provided. Now, for those of you who just joined, you can still log into this webinar by entering the URL website and pass code for instructions that were sent to you by email. Now, we do have a few housekeeping details to make sure everyone gets the most benefit from today's webinar. You will be able to hear this presentation via your telephone, and view it simultaneously through your computer. So if you are not hooked up to both, please take a moment to do this. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please press star zero anytime during this presentation. And during this webinar, we will be taking voice and written questions. Now, to ask a voice question, please press star one. To ask a written question, we invite you to type in your questions on your screen as they occur to you during this presentation. There is an icon for the letter Q&A on the upper left-hand side of your screen. Q&A stands for questions and answers, where you can click and type in your questions anytime during this presentation. And what we will do is we will compile the questions and present as many as time allows after the presentation. And any type questions which are not answered during this webinar due to time constraints, we will get back to you via a personal email. And now, just a reminder, for those of you who just joined on, you can still log in and join in the Internet conference. So now I'd like to introduce live online Mr. Scott Segamang, who is the Business Development Manager for REACH Services and the Industrial Services. Thank you, Scott, for joining us. Thank you, Linda. Good morning or afternoon uh, to everyone on the call, uh, depending on where you're located. Uh, I'd like to thank you on behalf of uh, QV Rhineland and the U.S. Department of Commerce uh, for taking the time to attend this EU REACH webinar today. Uh, during the uh, presentation, there will be a few uh, polling slides um, that I'd like to ask you to take at just a moment uh, to make a best guess selection, um, and then we'll talk about those possibly at the end of the uh, presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, topics today, um, I think uh, Linda covered them in brief, but to be more specific, um, why REACH is 
you know, was brought to fruition. Um, what is ECHA or the European Chemicals Agency? Uh, the basics of the REACH regulation. Uh, is your product or, you know, something that you're importing or exporting to the EU an article or a preparation? Who can register a particular substance under REACH? Um, the roles of the different companies in the supply chain? What the communication should be in the supply chain? Uh, registration procedures um, set forth by the European Chemicals Agency. Uh, the last registration timeline um, for the 1 to 100 ton range. The late pre-registration process. Uh, what is a CEF and consortia? Joint registration. Uh, what, compile, what consists of your dossier and what, what type of information you may need on your MSDS or FDS as they call it in the EU. What is an article, and also um, only representative, which uh, my colleague Natalie will cover in the second half of the presentation. So why was REACH enacted? As you can see from the slide, before 1981, there were approximately 140,000 existing substances being used with no real specific obligation to test any of the existing substances. After 1981, Approximately 4,300 of the new substances were introduced on the EU market, and they were required to be tested before even placing them on the market. So as you can see, there was a large gap in the tested and untested chemicals on the market. Thirty thousand of those existing chemicals were in excess of one metric ton, and there was no documented assessments of the hazard potential for humans and environment. From 1993 up until roughly the year 2000, only 100 or so of those 143,000 existing chemicals had any hazard assessments completed. So REACH basically is aimed at recovering that information about the potential hazards from the 143,000 existing chemicals that are found on the EU market. ECHA or E-E-C-H-A. I'm sure you guys have read about that or saw that in uh, the environmental headlines. ECHA is the European Chemicals Agency and was developed to overlook the new REACH regulation. It's located in Helsinki, Finland. It's comprised of over 500 employees from 27 different EU countries. The following tasks of the European Chemicals Agency is to provide technical guidance documents and assistance for registrants. Register, registrants. Um, basically, you can go onto the ECHO website and there's all kinds of different guide, guidance documents, um, tips, uh, Q&A, that type of thing. They, their job is to help you, you know, get through this process. Uh, they specifically deal with the registration applications. Those are typically handled via their proprietary software. Um, they do the completeness checks of all the dossiers that are provided um, via the uh, Euclid software. They do the coordination of the substance evaluation, and they also handle tasks with the uh, aspect of authorization and restrictions and the CLP and SBHC notifications. So what does the REACH regulation apply to? Uh, basically, they've set out three different definitions. So we have substances, substances and preparations, and substances and articles. So if you import into the EU or manufacture in the EU greater than one metric ton per year, um, you have an obligation um, to be part of REACH um, in regards to either product SBHC or constituent substances or substances and preparations, um, those three different aspects are the basics um, that REACH covers. Basically, if you have no data, you have no market. So no registered substances may not be placed on the European market. Now we come to our uh, first polling question. Um, who is asking your company for REACH compliance information? If you could just take a moment and uh, go ahead and make a selection on there, I'd appreciate it. Give you uh, 10 or 15 seconds to uh, look them over and uh, 
check some off. Okay, it looks like the majority of people uh, made a selection. I'm going to close the polls. And the highest result was 50%. Um, everybody said importer. So it looks like the importer is possibly your EU entity. Um, it could be your distributor. It could be you know, um, a middleman that's purchasing this stuff. But that's very good to know, and we can cover that. Natalie's going to cover that in, in regards to only representation yeah, and thanks. some of the benefits in regards to, you know, um, or disadvantages, I should say, depending on how you look at it, as to letting the importer handle that aspect. Okay. Moving on here. Now, SBHCs, or substances of very high concern, will require authorization uh, from ECHA. So, the guys out there that are importing finished goods that are going into the European, European Union, if your product is classified as an article and it contains more than the threshold amount of greater than 0.1% by weight, of a particular SBHC, and that particular SBHC is imported in excess of one metric ton, you need to know that notification to the European Chemicals Agency is required. Notification is a specific process, and please also note that there's an obligation in which downstream users and consumers must be informed about the SBHC in your product and where it is contained. So if you have some um, SBHC testing done, or you do, you know, some data collection and you find that within your particular product, you have an SBHC in excess of 0.1%. Um, there are some additional obligations. Um, if it exceeds one ton, you have a notification obligation, or if it does not, you definitely need to have an obligation to let your downstream user know what that SBHC is and where it's located within your particular article. Now, there are some exemptions um, to the particular uh, REACH regulation. Um, for example, radioactive substances or substances contained in waste, non-isolated intermediates, or polymers in general, but please consider that the monomers are um, the constituents of those polymers and they definitely come into scope. Pharmaceuticals, ingredients of food stuff, and also animal food. Uh, substances located in Annex 4 and 5 of the REACH regulation, those would be natural substances like sugar, water, oil, um, as well as some coal, cement, crude oil. There's a, a whole range of different ones if you want to check out um, Annex 4 and 5 uh, for the particular uh, exemptions or exceptions, I should say. Um, also, R&D substances and substances in the interest of defense. Uh, there is a catch there in regards to things that are already registered. So that would be active substances and pesticides and biocides, and also registered substances according to the EU regulation 67548 EEC on the classification and labeling will automatically get a registration, at least for the ones who have registered in the past. Okay. So then we come to the three different aspects of REACH, and these are the three different, different um, definitions. So a substance. Substance means a chemical element and its compounds in the natural state or obtained by any manufacturing process, including any additive necessary to preserve its stability and any impurity deriving from the process used, but excluding any solvent which may be separated without affecting the stability of the substance or changing its composition. Preparation, which basically that means it's a mixture or solution composed of two or more of the particular substances. 
And then lastly, we have the article, which means an object which during its production is given a special shape, surface, or design which determines its function to a greater degree than, it, than does its chemical composition. Remember, only the substances have to be registered, not the preparations, so the individual constituents of your preparation or formulation. Some products um, manufacturers may wonder if they have an article or a preparation. Here are a few examples and how they would be considered. Glue in a tube, caulk, or silicone in a plastic tube, lead or graphite in a pencil, or a candle with a fragrance. These products are not considered as articles, but preparations in a container. This means that each constituent of the preparation must be registered if it is imported in excess of one metric ton per year, and the container must be treated as an article and must meet the requirements as pertains to SPHC content. So in this situation, you have two different aspects. You're looking at the substances as one entity, and you're also looking at the container as an article. So you have two different aspects of reach to consider for these particular types of products. All right, we've come to the second polling question. Uh, how are you addressing SVHC content in your product? Uh, via lab analysis, supplier declarations, supplier test results, or are you subcontracting out data collection services? So if you could take a few seconds um, to make a selection. Okay, polls are closed. Looks like, I would say, wow, um, about 90% of you guys are using lab analysis and supplier declarations. That's good. Um, definitely, you know, lab analysis is the, uh, the best case because you get uh, uh, the information right to you. It's unbiased. You don't know if uh, your supplier has tampered with the, the information, and so that's good. Uh, you guys are making the right decision. Uh, supplier declarations, on the other hand, um, that's up for, you know, interpretation. Um, you definitely need to re read the fine print in regards to that um, because, you you know, what they're declaring may be not what particularly, you know, uh, you're asking them. So please be cognizant and read thoroughly uh, what they're actually uh, declaring to you. Okay, so uh, who can register um, a uh, substance under reach? Um, basically, you have, you know, the EU manufacturer, um, you have the importer, and you have the only representative. In those cases, all of those people um, are natural or legal persons established in the EU. Um, that definitely is a must. So if you're in the situation that you're importing more than one metric ton of a particular substance per, um, per sub, a substance per year per distributor, um, make sure that you're either a manufacturer, your manufacturer is based in the EU, um, importer or EU entity is within the EU, or you, lastly, you reach out and take an only representative um, to cover this for you. Um, Natalie is going to definitely cover um, a, a very detailed overview of um, only representative services, um, what it entails for you, the advantages and disadvantages, and um, it, it definitely stick around for that portion of it because, you know, uh, as we stated before, it looks like you're, you're leading this up to your importer, and there's definitely some advantages for you to take care of it and um, not let the importer, you know, have all this particular proprietary information for your particular product. So what are the roles of the um, actors in the supply chain? If you look at all these different, you know, the manufacturer, importer, downstream user, distributor, 
a common requirement in all the roles in the communication. This communication involves uses, usage, proper MSDS or SDS, and SBHC requirements. This is a general overview of, you know, depending on who's placing it on the market, in general, what their requirements would be. This slide is a representation of the supply chain and the sharing of information for consumer industrial use. As you can see, information is passed up and down the supply chain, and it is a key aspect of reach. So the information regarding to the uses, um, the particular risks, um, any exposure scenarios, that basically has to be transparent and, you know, transferred up and down the supply chain uh, and supplied to the person who's going to actually register um, that particular product on the market. Okay, we've come to another uh, polling question. Uh, who are handling your compliance um, with the substances greater than one time? I don't know. I'm not really sure of the uh, audience here. So if there's anybody on the call that's actually importing substances um, versus uh, products, um, so the more of the non-SBHC um, types of clients. Okay. Kind of mixed here. Looks like. Well, it's pretty even, actually. So we have um, about 30% for pre-registration, um, some contract of the registration or the dealing with the compliance, and 30% have done nothing as of yet, probably due to the timeline. Interesting. So we have to consider that, um, you know, our last timeline for the 1 to 100 ton is coming up here um, at the end of 2017 or 2018. So um, we definitely need to, you know, depending on the complexity of your product, the number of substances, um, you know, it is a lengthy process. And if you guys haven't looked into it, that there are some um, pretty hefty costs typically associated with uh, letter of access in regards to um, getting into the thief. Um So please, you know, budget out and take some time in advance. You do have, um, you know, a few more years left to prepare for this, um, please consider, you know, time is of the essence, so, you know, spread out that money because, uh, you know, we do have a couple of years left to go. So let's go over the registration process. What is the registration process? Um, if you've determined that your tonnage amounts uh, will exceed one metric ton per year and your imported substances substance is not exempted, the first step you can do is late pre-registration. This process has to be done with the European Chemicals Agency. After the pre-registration is completed, your particular substance will be classified with the appropriate thief or substance information exchange form, and as part of that registration, the dossier must also be completed. That's a very time-consuming step. Um, we'll cover it in the next couple slides what's what at a minimum is to be included. But depending on the hazard classification and tonnage, different levels of information will be required. After your dossier is completed, it must be submitted to ECHA via the use of their website and proprietary software, the Euclid 5. If accepted, a registration number will be assigned and it must be added to your existing SDS or MSDS. Then this new MSDS will then be required to support the be supplied to your supply chain. So all the information you've um, collected for your technical dossier um, goes into this you know, registration process. The packet accepts it. There's some extended um, comments that will be added and added to your SDS. That will be, you know, renew your SDS, and they have to then again share it with all of the uh, uh, particular people in your supply chain. Okay, so the, the transitional timelines I spoke about in brief are uh, graphically represented on this slide. Um, if you look to the right, currently we are in the 1 uh, to 100 tonnage band. 
Uh, this means that substances imported in amounts greater than 100 metric tons uh, will, will require immediate registration uh, before placing on the market. Also note that uh, CMR category one and two substances in excess of one metric ton per year will also require immediate registration and that was as of December 1st of 2010. So if you have any uh, uh, CMR one or two in excess of one ton in your particular formulation, um, you know, in order to move on, you need to, to process immediate registration to move forward. Okay, we come up, I believe this is our last poll question. Uh, who will be registering your substances? So we have internally, uh, importer, uh, subcontract, or don't know. Give a few seconds here to uh, make some selections. Okay, we'll pull, close the polls. Looks like 40% uh, um, are handling this internally. That's interesting. Um, I've heard that you know um, the software itself is is quite difficult to manipulate, um, and you know to actually prepare the dossier. It is quite an intricate process. Okay, so what happens if you're, um, if you have not performed your pre-registration? Basically, um, you can't benefit from the deadline uh, for your ton exam. Um, immediate registration is required and you would not be able to import until that is complete. However, it is possible to perform a late pre-registration, but this is only possible if the product exported to the EU is classified as a new import. Um, late pre-registrations must be performed within six months of the first new import and at the latest 12 months before the defined registration deadline. Please note that you could also retain an only representative to act as your EU entity thus essentially classifying your product as a new import so you can take advantage of the extended timelines. So you may have all heard about CIFs and consortias. Um, basically, it's a group of companies that use the same substance, and it's a forum uh, to exchange the information and data. It's, it, basically, the goal is to prevent duplicate testing. There's an option to join a consortia as part of the joint uh, dossier submission. And of course, there are costs associated with joining and, and using of the data as part of the uh, joint registration. So if you have a particular substance you're registering, um, you would go in and enter that as a part of a pre-registration. ECHA is going to take and pool all the same substances together and give you information on how to join or become part of these thieves or consortiums to share information, share data, uh, so there's not a lot of redundant testing and additional costs um, in, in, you know, duplicating these tests. So a joint registration is a collective of individual dossiers that, you know, you as a manufacturer, uh, importer, formulator would complete. Um, it's submitted to ECHA as one joint dossier covering your aspects as well as others. So in this slide example, uh, there's two manufacturers and one importer forming a joint dossier for submission. So each company or each manufacturer importer uh, compiles a dossier. Um, they pool it all together, um, looking at all of the, the summary of the studies, um, the, uh, summary of tests, other information, uses that type together and they all join up in, in one joint dossier is submitted to the European Chemicals Agency. So it's expected that up to 100,000 dossiers will be created during the whole registration period. This is a legal obligation to submit joint submissions to avoid the unnecessary uh, testing that I spoke of. 
Um, the thief and consortia are there for a reason. ECHA does not have any influence on the consortia, and each consortia will have its own rules and requirements. Each typically also requires a contractual agreement. So depending on the particular substance, you may be dealing with multiple seats or multiple consortia, um, depending on the particular substances that you have in your formulation or are importing uh, into the European Union. So this slide covers um, the main elements of a technical dossier uh, for the registration. Uh, one of the bullet points, identif uh, identity of the producer or importer, identity of the substance, including a substance analysis. So uh, your substance has to be verified via a lab. Um, there's a particular process uh, for substance analysis that they've defined in different methods that have to be used. Uh, intrinsic information of the substance, um, production and usage of, of the substance, uh, classification and labeling, all the summary uh, details of the physiochem, toxicological, and echotoxicological studies, uh, guidelines, uh, risk management for safe use, uh, secrecy uh, for special information, uh, below 10 tons uh, per year, um, usage and exposure categories have to be defined. Above 10 tons, uh, CSR uh, is required. So this slide indicates uh, the information requirements based on quantities manufactured or imported. And as you can see, the higher the quantity, the more information is required. So at the uh, greater than one ton level, basically a uh, technical LTA and some tests as described in Annex 6. And as you progress up, all categories or all the annexes plus the CSR is required. So the more you import, the more information you require in testing. Um, these are just some of the standard information that they're going to call out in regards um, to the dossier. Physio uh, physiochemical data, um, basic information, uh, melting point, vapor, pressure, explosive properties, um, toxicological data, um, eye scan, a lot of the information that you probably already have in regards onto your um, SDS. Um, but this, obviously this would be uh, per substance. MSDS. So region CLP regulations uh, replaced um, the safety sheets, uh, uh, safety data sheets directive. Uh, the current duties and responsibilities for SDS remain and will be extended by the requirement to convey information from any uh, chemical safety assessment. Uh, for instance, when where a chemical safety assessment is performed, um, that would be substances placed on the market in quantities greater than 10 tons per, uh, per annum. Uh, the relevant safety or uh, relevant exposure scenarios shall be placed in an annex on the safety data sheet. Um, these exposure scenarios uh, contain a description of risk management measures um, which the manufacturer or importer shall implement and recommend uh, to downstream users as well. Um, what about articles under reach? Um, so when we talk about SDHCs, what we are considering are CMR substances, category one and two, so carcinogenic, mutagenic, or toxic for reproduction, uh, PBT, persistent bioaccumulative and toxic substances, um, VPVB, uh, very persistent, very bioaccumulative, and also any uh, other substances of equivalent concern with scientific evidence or serious effects on the human and health environment. An uh, example would be endocrine disrupting properties. So those are what uh, summarize the uh, SBHCs that we're looking at uh, for the particular uh, articles. So articles have two distinctive requirements. Um, you must register substances that are released if the substance exceeds one ton per year and notification of the SBHC substance if it is present in the article in excess of 0.1% and imported um, in volumes greater than one ton per year. So basically we have two requirements. Looking at the SBHC content, um, if it has intended release, 
Um, is it going to be greater than one ton per year? So you have an additional step for notification. Examples, um, articles could be furniture, clothes, vehicles, toys. Um, you know, it's a very broad scope. So um, basically any product you place on the market reach um, will, you know, have some impact on that particular product. So this is a, a slide, is a flow chart on how to handle articles and substances contained in articles. Um, this one is based on intended release or not. Um, so substances contained in an article and imported in excess of more than one ton per annum with intended release will require pre-registration and registration, obviously, um, if, if the one ton threshold is met. Um, substances that are not intended to be released but are classified as SVHC and in excess of 0.1% by weight of the article and are imported in amounts greater than one ton um, uh, would, would require, you know, registration as well. So you have to look at it as intended release, um, the amount, is it going to exceed one ton? If it is, you, you may have a pre-registration and registration duty. Um, if you have a particular substance contained in an, as an SDHC, um, but it's not intended to release, um, you may have a duty to you know, notify ECHA, and they can also obviously um, request uh, registration uh, depending on the particular SBHC and the content um, per annum. So authorization may be required for an SBHC, and ECHA uh, will determine which substances will be placed on the authorization list and for how long they will be allowed to be used. Um, this information that will be required um, to, this is the information that will be required to apply for authorization. Um, basically, you'll need uh, the risk caused by the uses of the substance, the analysis of the um, and the alternatives, uh, the socioeconomic analysis, and any available information on the risks uh, to human health or the environment of any alternative substances and technolo uh, technologies. So if you're going to apply for authorization, these are some of the bullet points um, that you will need. This is a flow chart representing the authorization methodology. So the factors are controlled risk, technical and economical alternatives, and socioeconomic benefits. Um, the result will be a case-by-case -case approval, authorization approval, um, either that, the ban of a substance, or a substitution mandate by the European Chemicals Agency. So depending on where you're at, um, just follow through the flow chart. This is basically how ECHA um, will uh, address, you know, authorization process with you. Um, they're going to ask these particular questions and come up with a result, either allow it, ban it, or substitute it. So to summarize um, some recommendations, please synthesize your company um, to what REACH requires. Uh, don't assume that REACH will not apply to you. Uh, please understand it covers much more than just chemical imports into the European Union. Look for consultants and experts to perform an impact assessment uh, to determine your gaps. Uh, it's, you know, obviously a third party looking at it would have less bias than maybe internally. Also, make sure to budget and plan ahead as REACH is both time consuming and can require a substantial investment to uh, retain your market share. Please also note, European customers have a choice. They will choose REACH compliant products over the ones that are not. So with that, um, I guess I'd like to turn it over um, to Natalie Moreau. Um, my last slide is just the um, overview of our particular services. Uh, we can handle all of the previous aspects I covered, um, from training all the way up to audit and follow-up um, so, Natalie, if you'd like to go ahead with your part of the presentation. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Scott. Yeah. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah, I would like to thank a lot the U.S. Department of Commerce, um, as well as my colleague from TUV Rhineland, to 
um, yeah, to have the opportunity to share my experience with you uh, regarding the new representative and their age. Um, what is quite interesting, and um, I think, I guess, uh, yeah, the small interview that we got um, during the presentation of Michael Ifcott uh, is quite representative of the results of the registration. Um, it means that uh, my colleague uh, sh just showed to you and explained to you that there were different several registration deadlines. The first one was in 2010 for all substances above 1,000 tons per year and very hazardous substances. And the second one was in last year, in May 2013, for all substances between 100 and 1,000 tons per year. What is quite um, surprising is that normally on the European market, we consider that smaller the tonnage, more substances are on the European market. And as you can see on the slide, uh, it was much less registration performed in 2013 than in 2010. Um, there is not any official explanation about this decrease of the registration. Uh, what we can guess already is that maybe the letter of access were too expensive. Um, just for information, you have to be aware that the letter of access uh, cost depends on each substance. Um, as my colleague just explained, uh, the European Chemicals Agency does not have any influence on the cost. And for information, uh, we have letter of access from, let's say, 2,000 euro per substance per company to 300,000 euro. So you can imagine if a company has to pay 300,000 euro, maybe the company will decide not to register at the end. Um, then it is a fact. We have a, a very big European economical crisis, so it means that lots of people uh, maybe had some decreasing tonnage or decreasing import quantities and that decided not to register in 2013 and maybe postpone the registration in 2018. One um, additional reason is um, maybe that companies are forgotten to register because of no lack. Uh, so you have to be aware that the, first, the two first registration de deadline, um, or the, the first one was in November, and the second one was in May. So when we we suppose that some companies still think that all registration deadlines are in November. So, um, and that's why and we got lots of, of uh, phone calls from companies asking for the registration uh, for example, in, in September 2013. So we had to explain to the company that the registration deadline was not in November, but already in May, and that the products were not legally on the market anymore. Um, in any case, um, yeah, it's a fact. It means uh, that finally we expect that a lot of substances will be finally registered in 2018. Uh, what is quite... Um, Interesting as well is that uh, the small and medium European enterprises consider the rich regulation and the most burdensome European law ever enacted. So, and that's why I think maybe some of you already got some pressure from your European customer in order to take over the compliance, uh, because especially the small and medium enterprise, uh, they do not want to spend some time and some resource and some cost for sure for the rich registration. Um, so it's, it's a slide that you already saw uh, just before. Um, just to, to be sure that you already understood, it means that only European legal entities can perform a registration. So, and that's why the European Commission um, has decided by the developing of the rich regulation to give the possibility to non-European companies to take over the rich uh, regulation, the rich compliance. I will explain you um, why it is important. Um, in any case, you have different solutions in order to take over the registration. You can use, for example, a legal entity in Europe, if you have any trade office in Europe, or a sign on your representative. Um, so we, we have put Switzerland uh, as indirect export to the European Union. Uh, please be aware that Switzerland is not part of the European Union. So, for example, if you export to Switzerland, it is not considered as an export to the European Union. Um, I know it could be 
could sound crazy for some people of you or funny or maybe stupid because you already know it, um, but we have a lot of experience. And after eight years, I can say to you that lots of people believe that Switzerland or UK um, are part of the European Union. It's not the fact. So you have ready to uh, take care about which country you export some products to. So here on the following slide, you can see the standard situation in the rich regulation. Uh, what does it mean? It means that um, basically the importer are responsible for the rich regulation and for the rich registration. But what happens if your European importer take over the registration? It means, for example, if you have three different customers in Europe, the three customers, the three companies have to go to the registration. So what is quite important is that if you get another customer in the future, then this new customer will have to be compliant with REACH as well. So it's quite a limitation on the market. Um, what is very important as well is, um, yeah, my colleague just explained that the preparation should not, not be registered. So what does it mean? It means, for example, if you export, export a paint to Europe, so not the paint should be registered, but the constituent in it. It means some fillers, some dyes. So, and if the importer take care about the registration, they have to get the composition. So, and it's a very, very big issue um, at the moment, and since the beginning of reach, and it will still be a big issue. Why? Because for sure you can imagine, and I think for your company it is exactly the same. It means the composition is quite a confidential information. But you have ready to understand that if a company in Europe would like to go for the rich compliance, they have to start with the composition analysis. So as a services provider, it is as well the first information we have got customer in order, in order to go further, yeah. So that's quite a very big limitation for companies as well. Um, the last point that is very important as well is, for example, if I take the company one, the company one will register. The registration dossier will not be connected with the supplier in any case. It means the registration will be performed under the name of company one. What does it mean? It means, for example, that if you have one customer having registered, this company is not connected to your company. It means that they can choose any other um, supplier outside for the European Union because the registration dossier is submitted for one substance and the company as importer. I think you will understand better the situation on the following slide. So here, for example, um, it is one solution that we can see sometimes. It means, for example, okay, the, your company is able or agree to disclose the composition information to one unique company, for example. So it is um, almost a situation when some non-European companies, non-European manufacturers have, uh, for example, an exclusive retailer in Europe. Um, then they share the, the information with the exclusive retailer, and the exclusive retailer take over the registration. Here again, there are some different aspects um, what, that are quite important to consider. It means um, okay, the exclusive retailer has two, di two different possibilities. The first one is ready to register as importer, but once again, here the big inconvenience for you is that the registration will not be connected with your company's own or to work as only representative. What is quite important is that if the campaign, the registration is performed, by the European customers or by an uh, exclusive retailer, the good delivery has to be really um, performed between your company and the customers. So it's not the case with an only representative. So as already explained, uh, one solution for, for non-European companies to take over the registration is to assign a so-called only representative. Here, the good delivery will not be changed. It means the only representative does not act as importers or exclusive retailer. 
it is the representative company for the REACH regulation. What is quite important is if there is an only representative, the European importer are not considered anymore as importer under the meaning of the REACH regulation. They will be considered as downstream users. It means by assigning an only representative, the American company, for example, will take over the obligation of importers. What is very important in that case is uh, compared to the standard situation. Here, the registration will be submitted in name of the company in, uh, located outside the European Union. It means, for example, in your case, in name of the U.S. company. So, um, what does it mean, for example, if you have some new customer? Then the new customer will not need to register anymore. Why? Because, as I just explained, the customer in Europe are not considered as importer anymore. So, you have the possibility to increase your market much more without any limitation or, let's say, without rich limitation anymore. And what is quite important as well is as the registration will be directly connected with your company, then the importer or your customer in Europe will be connected with the supplier. It means with your company. So, for example, if we take again the customer one, so he purchased some goods in your company and the same substance, for example, in another supplier outside the Europe. Then for your goods, it will be clear that the goods are rate compliant. But the customer one has to take care that the other supplier is as well rate compliant. That's very important because, for example, if uh, the customer won't get an inspection from the European authorities and is not able to prove the rate compliance of the other supplier, for example, then the customer one could get some penalties. And believe me, the penalties are quite high. So it's, it's a very uh, important regulation. But the most important, I think, is really the fact that ev every new customer will be covered by your registration. So it's, it's really less limitation on the market because of the rich regulation. And the second uh, very big advantage is really that the European customer are connected, really bound to your company because if they have they would like to get another supplier, then they have to check again the rich compliance of the other supplier. So the advantage of the only representative, I think you could already understand the situation. Uh, in any case, for, for non-European, for example, American companies, um, the only representative uh, allows the company not to set up an European office. I, I mean, it's quite complicated and it's... Uh, in almost all time, it's not so interesting to set up an office, yeah? Uh, what is the, the most important thing, and it is what we could already show, observe on the European market in the last few years, is really the confidential, um, confidentiality aspect. It means, okay, with an only representative, for sure, you have to, to give um, the composition information, for example, to the only representative, but as the European customer, do not need to register anymore, then they do not need the composition anymore. And that's, um, I think it's one of the reasons why so many companies um, outside the European Union uh, have taken care about the rich registration. Um, maybe we're getting this point for your information for the 2010 and the 2013 registration deadline, around about 20% of the registration were submitted as on your representative, it means in name of non-European companies. So, and these statistics show that uh, our important the rich regulation is considered outside the European Union as well. So, and as you could understand, um, the big advantage if, if the supplier outside the European Union take over the rich compliance, um, the European customer, they do not have any uh, obligation for the rate registration. They have some other obligation, and it's already a lot, but they do not have to take care about the registration. And a very important point is uh, that they do not need to build up a specific internal rate now, um, and it's especially very important for small and medium enterprise. 
uh, in any case, what is quite important is really if your company, I could see that some companies have, have already proceeded with the first step of the registration, it's very important to communicate to your European customer because um, lots of my customers in Europe, for example, they, right now they try to look for alternative suppliers and especially rich compliant suppliers because they don't want to take care and that's why they make some pressure on the supplier or they look for some alternative suppliers. So if you, you take over or yeah, the compliance, the rich compliance, don't hesitate to use it as marketing advantage uh, in Europe in any case. So some, some legal aspects regarding the only representative. Uh, you have to keep in mind that the only representative is not a commercial um, role. It is really um, a representative entity only for the rich compliance. It's very, very important. Um, and um, yeah, I will explain you later which kind of obligation are, are, yeah, exist because lots of only representatives are, are not aware about it. Um, some, some basic rules. Um, a non-European manufacturer can only appoint one only representative per substance. But for example, if you have 10 substances, you can have one only representative for the five first substances and one second only representative, a different one for the five other substances. Uh, it's, it's what we can see uh, a lot already um, in any case. Um, what is quite important as well um, is that a non-representative can represent several non-European manufacturers. So, for example, uh, to Finland act as a non-representative for some companies, uh, some rubber manufacturers in, in India especially. So, and here we represent companies with exactly the same substances. It is allowed uh, in any case in the rich regulation, but we have to consider um, each company as, as one unique manufacturer. So what does it mean? Um, so my colleague has explained to you that there is an obligation to, to provide or to submit a joint registration dossier. So it is a big dossier, and in order to be part of the joint registration dossier, uh, companies have to pay a letter of access. So in case uh, we act as only representative for different manufacturers, but with the same substances, for sure we have to purchase a le one letter of access for each non-European manufacturer that we represent. Uh, you have really to take care about this point because we do not have the experience, this experience in the U.S. until now, uh, but especially in, in China, uh, let's say China, Taiwan, and Indonesia, uh, we got some feedback that uh, some services providers explained that they can have some very cheap letter of access. Uh, it is only possible if they use the same letter of access for all customers they represent, and that's not not legal. For sure, it's very interesting for companies because it's cheaper, but at the end, if the importers get some inf inspection or the only representative, then uh, there is very high risk to get some penalties because of the non-legal uh, registration. So take care about, about this fact because we um, – yeah, we heard about the situation more and more, and especially in the few last months. Uh, what is very, very important is that it's not enough only to say, okay, I assign this company A in Europe as my only representative uh, because there is some obligation. Um, the main obligation of only representative is to have up-to-date information about the customers in Europe covered by your registration as well as the quantities. Uh, why? You have to consider it from the European Union point of view. It means from the importer's point of view. Even if you get, uh, if you assign an only representative, your company as such will never get inspection. Maybe your only representative, but never your company. So, but your customer will get some inspection. So we could already see that some of you get some requests from uh, the customs. So the customs are part of the inspection. 
Um, and for example, if one of the customer imports 100 tons of a substance, he purchased 50 tons by your company and 50 tons by another supplier. Then by the inspection, this customer will explain to the competent authorities, okay, I'm compliant because my supplier in the U.S. has assigned an unrepresentative. representative In that case, the competent authorities will go to the unrepresentative representative in order to ask if this customer in Europe is really covered, and what is the quantity? Why? Because we come back to the situation I have already explained. If we will say, for example, as a new representative, okay, this customer is in fact covered by the registration of the American companies, but for example, in 2013, he has purchased only 50 tons. So, and here, the competent authorities will come back to the customer in Europe and say, okay, for 50 tons, you are covered, but please prove that for the other 50 tons, you are as well covered by any registration. So, and that's why, um, for your information, for example, by, by TUV, we have um, developed some, some follow-up assessment. It means on a regularly basis, normally twice a year, we visit the company or we ask um a list of all quantities exported to Europe with the corresponding um, customers in Europe in order that we are able to show the compliance for the company in case of inspection. So for your information, the inspection is going to be stronger and stronger, and it's not only the large enterprise that are controlled, but generally all kind of companies. So that's the and maybe some information regarding the inspection as well. Um, I, we just saw that some of you got some inquiries from the customs. So the customs are definitely one point of inspection in Europe. But as well, each member state was responsible to set up a kind of a competent authorities, especially for the rate regulation. So and, uh, we have a project in Europe called a Rich in Force. It means that the European Chemicals Agency set up kind of targets relating to the inspection. So there is really some pressure on each member state to perform the inspection and yeah, give feedback about the inspection to the European Chemicals Agency. So uh, once again, the inconvenience and advantage by non-assignment of an unrepresentative representative so if, if your customer take over uh, the, registr the registration, it means the importer, then you are completely dependent from them uh, in order to, to supply uh, the goods to the European Union. Um, the importers can change the supplier and the registration if they have already registered without any problem. Um, there is some risk of uh, confidentiality break in any case because, as explained, your European customer, if they take over the rich regulation, the rich compliance, they have to get some information about the composition in any case. So, and you have ready to take care uh, as well about um, some, some purchasing contracts because uh, we have in Europe more and more company that oblige the supplier to take over the rich compliance and they include this obligation in the purchase contract of the goods. So take care about any change um, relating to the purchase documentation. Um, but for sure, if your customer in Europe take over, then you don't have to uh, involve some, some, some resource, um, uh, either human resource or uh, financial resource as well in the registration. So, and um, in, in that case, um, yeah, for sure, it's cheaper for you um, in any case. So, and by, by on your representative or if your company um, take over, let's say, uh, the regulation, the rich compliance, by using either an on your representative or a legal entity in Europe, um, for sure, the big inconvenient is that you take care about the cost of the registration and it could be sometimes very expensive and you have to get some sufficient knowledge in order to take care about uh, the registration procedures. Um, but the big advantage is really that uh, you keep control uh, on the supply chain in Europe. You are not dependent from your European importers anymore, 
and for sure you don't have to disclose some confidential information about the composition. And I think it is personally I really think that it is the main um the main reason why non European companies take over the rich compliance. Um yeah, some some expectation to finish my presentation, some expectation from uh, the European customers. As I already said, more and more European companies make some pressure on the supplier in order that they take over the rich compliance. You have really to understand that the European companies are really, really fed up with rich regulation, yeah? So uh, we still speak about rich um, already since 2007, and uh, it's really too much for the European companies. And... Uh, you have ready to take care because, as I said, uh, the, the European companies are really aware. Normally about REACH, they know about the cost uh, involved in the REACH regulation. So that's why be aware that the European customer, they are as well ready to pay maybe a little bit more for REACH compliant products. I know it's not easy to increase the price just because of that, uh, but please be aware that REACH compliant products have definitely a big advantage on the European market. Um, one very sensitive topic now, the material safety data sheet. So uh, it was a very big problem in the past and it's going to be a very big problem in the future. Means, um, yeah, normally and without the rich regulation already, you have to send European compliant material safety data sheet uh, to Europe together with your product. I know it's a very big topic because the current regulation in the U.S. is totally different from the European one, and it's uh, not so easy to develop European material safety data sheet. Uh, what is quite important is um, that the material safety data sheet uh, should be updated not only according to REACH, but also according to the CLP regulation. So the CLP regulation is um, the regulation according to the global harmony, globally harmonized system from the United Nations that is already in place in the U.S. And a very important point and a very difficult point for everybody is uh, normally the MSDS should be in the language of the country where the product is exported to. Uh, that's a big challenge for the companies. I'm, I'm really aware about it. Um, but for us, it's very important. Why? Because one point of the inspection concerning rage is as well the material safety data sheet. So... Don't be surprised if you if you get more and more inquiries regarding the material safety data sheet. It's really because your customer in Europe are really depend on you regarding the material safety data sheet. They cannot develop it by themselves, and uh, that's why if they get some inquiries from the from the authority, they don't have any solution but to ask you further um, the material safety data sheet. So and that's a very big challenge right now. Uh, but to be honest, if we considered all material safety data sheets, I have only saw maybe seen maybe four or five already compliant material safety data sheets. That's all. Almost material safety data sheets are not fully compliant. So to maybe to make a short conclusion of my um, presentation and um, my experience as well the eight last year is really I don't say you to go directly and, and to, to rush to the registration. It's not possible. Why? Because uh, the rich registration is, is, means very high costs have to be invested in any case. Um, so what I recommend you is not to rush to the registration, but to analyze the situation of your company. It means you have to see which kind of substances of products you export to Europe, what are your possibilities, what is the statute of the substances in Europe, um, and, and the target is really that we, you get all required information in order that your company is able to take a decision about the registration. So it, it's really my, my, my final recommendation uh, regarding the rich regulation in, in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie. And now we will go to our question and answer session. So if you have a voice question, please press star 1 on your telephone. And if you have a written question, on the upper left-hand side of your screen, you'll see the letters Q&A. You can click on that tab and type in your answer, or type in your question, and we will answer them as well. So I'll turn, off, I'll turn it to the operator 
to first ask voice questions. And at this time, I'm showing no questions. And again, just press star one to ask a question. And just as a reminder, I would encourage everybody to take this opportunity and ask a question. We have our experts right here now. We have Scott and Natalie, and they are very good and very knowledgeable about this topic. So if you have specific questions, please take advantage of this time in this webinar uh, to ask them while they're here live. That's, that's the best part about this. Any, any question that you have, any that's specific to your company, please ask it now because they're here live to answer your questions. And again, just press star one to ask a question. Okay, it looks like we have a one question. Sorry. Yeah, maybe companies, the people have to digest all information first. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sala, Jyoti, I know that you're trying to ask a question. If you can't write it, then please feel free to press star one on the telephone and voice your question. Either way is fine. Okay. Now, this question she has is, can we get a copy of the presentation? Yes, I got clearance through our speakers. Yes, we can give you a copy of today's presentation. And also, there will be a net replay of today's presentation that will immediately follow as well. At this time, I'm showing no questions on the phone lines. Okay. Well, I know we ran overboard, and that could be a reason why uh, there are not as many questions, but that's okay. In any case, uh, we will then conclude this webinar. And just as a reminder, if you do have questions that you think later on or you might uh, have, just write it on the Q&A or note the email address and the contact information that is in front of you with Scott and please contact him or call him with your specific question. Also, um, I just want to let everyone know that please check out our website here at the commercial service slash global markets at the Department of Commerce. We have a website at www.export.gov, which has more information on upcoming webinars like this. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you, of course, to Scott and Natalie at TUV Rhineland of North America for your expertise and time and your presentation today. Thank you very much. And also, I'd like to thank all of our participants uh, for joining us. So please check your email boxes for more information and more upcoming webinars. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This does conclude today's conference. We thank you for your participation. At this time, you may disconnect your lines.